Rugnet Odor and Tyler Nevin. I bet when I said both those names, you as an Orioles fan had some sort of reaction, and that's the year it was for both of those guys. So today we try to answer the question, are either of them ever going to play a game in an Orioles uniform again? That's all coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles, your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, Orioles fans. Today is Tuesday, November 1st, 2022, and welcome back in to the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb. And coming up on today's episode, we're going to take a look back at two infielders and their 2022 seasons with the Orioles in our O's 2022 player season review series. We're going to talk about Tyler Nevin, how he hung around the Orioles roster for most of this season, but by the second half, basically wasn't playing at all. And then we'll talk about Rugnet Odor. He was great in the big moments. He was pretty bad in a lot of other moments. We'll try to sum up his season and talk about whether or not either guy will ever play a game again for the Baltimore Orioles. But that's all coming up on this episode of the Locked on Orioles podcast. But before we get there, just did want to thank you for making Locked on Orioles your first podcast listen of the day. We're free and available on all podcast listing platforms, whether it be Spotify or Apple Pods. If you could leave a five-star rating and a review on those sites, really, really helps out the pod. And of course, like, comment, and subscribe to the Locked on Orioles YouTube page if you haven't already. You can, uh, if you're just listening right now, you can see my face as I do these Orioles podcast videos as well. We thank you all so much. And we do have an update on the content this offseason. We're going to be going five days a week, a little longer than expected. So as we start the month of November here, of course, with World Series Game 3 being rained out and postponed last night, they will play Game 3 tonight, which means the latest the World Series would end would be Game 7 now this Sunday when it's scheduled for. But that won't be the end of the daily podcast. We will go five days a week throughout the month of November here on the podcast. You can expect the finish up of, you know, all of these player review series I'm going to do as well. Some off season preview content. And then five days after the world series ends, you know, late next week, we're going to be into the off season and covering every move the Orioles make from those rule five draft protections, minor league signings, all the way up to maybe some blockbuster trades and huge free agents to bring in. As Michael Elias said, it's lift off this off season and I'll have you covered daily through the month of November as well. Then we'll go down to three days a week at some point in December for the rest of the off season. We'll still have all your Orioles content right here on the locked on Orioles podcast. And I thank you so, so much for making locked on Orioles your first listen of the day. Well, for your first podcast, listen today, let's jump right into it. Two players, two infielders for the Orioles who Certainly weren't stars of this team, but each of them made their mark, I would say, at least in a certain way this season. So let's start with Tyler Nevin, who I think most would agree had a tough year for the Orioles this year. Nevin, a 25-year-old who the Orioles acquired back at the 2020 trade deadline when they dealt right-handed pitcher Michael Gibbons to the Colorado Rockies. They received Taryn Vavra, Tyler Nevin, and Michelle Desson in that trade for Givens. And it has still turned out to be, I think, a great trade by the Orioles. You know, Givens has not been the same since he left Baltimore. And Vavra and Nevin have already reached the big leagues. Vavra, Vavra's had a little more success in less big league time. Desson, the Orioles still like in the low minor leagues. So, you know, there's a potential for three big leaguers and at the very least two big leaguers out of that trade and one who could be an impact player, I still think, in Taryn Vavra. But I don't think Tyler Nevin, has turned into what the Orioles wanted him to be. When they got him, he was this super patient, you know, corner infielder, corner outfielder prospect, son of a big leaguer, of course, son of Phil Nevin, who, you know, had a great batter's eye, didn't strike out a lot, and could hit for some power, and played some solid defense at four different positions. And that's what they got when they brought him over here, and, you know, it's mostly what they got in AAA last year. And we got a little peek at Tyler Nevin, if you remember, really at the end of the year in 2021. Now, he only had 18 big league plate appearances for the Orioles last year, but 
hey, you know what? He was four for 14. He had a couple of doubles. He had a monster home run the last weekend of the year in Toronto last year, and at least put him on a solid radar heading into 2022 with the Orioles, especially for a team that did not really have an answer at all at third base. That position was pretty much open for Nevin to take after they had DFL'd Michael Franco last year and didn't really bring in anyone to replace him. I mean, his, his main foe there was, I mean, you could say Kelvin Gutierrez early in the season, and then, you know, it turned out to be Ramon Arias and, and Jorge Mateo as well with Rugnet Odor on the team, but there was certainly space for him to see the field. But when he did early in the year, it just wasn't good. And then it got worse late this year for Tyler Nevin in his age 25 season. He just wasn't good. His final stats, he played 58 games for the Orioles this year and in 184 plate appearances for the Birds, he hit just 197 with a 299 on base percentage and just a 261 slugging. That was good for just a 67 WRC plus, making him 33% worse than the league average hitter this year. Now his 11% walk rate, that's was what you like to see. 25% strikeout rate, not so much. He struck out really more than he ever had in any of his professional seasons. His walk rate was still high, but it was just not good stuff from Tyler Nevin. And you looked around and you just wondered, what kind of player is he going to be? Because again, he had had 18 big league plate appearances before this. This wasn't even a full big league season, but this was the first time he got any substantial big league time at all. So I'm not ready to shut the book on Tyler Nevin whatsoever. But it was a struggle at times this year. I mean, they hoped he would be, you know, this on-base guy, a lefty masher. Well, his on-base percentage was below 300. And yeah, he had a 99 WRC plus against lefties. That's still below average. And then a 46 WRC plus against righties. He was literally just an automatic out against right-handed pitching this year. And he just kind of wasn't playable down the stretch. And he was never really an everyday starter for the Orioles this year. But he played a solid amount early in the year. Tyler Nevin only played in 11 games after the All-Star break this year. And he was with the team through August. He was finally sent down to AAA on August 31st when the Orioles finally promoted Gunnar Henderson to the big leagues. He took Nevin's spot, obviously. But he was with the team for six weeks after the trade or after the All-Star break and played in just 11 games. And some of those games... He was just a late substitution, a blowout, or maybe a defensive replacement. Like he wasn't even getting 11 starts in that stretch. So he'd basically been sent to the bench because the stats just were not there for Nevin. Now he came back up right at the end of the year because the O's had the injury to Ramon Arias. So they recalled him on September 28th. He played on that day. And then he played on the final day of the season as well down the stretch. And he did get a hit in that September 28th game. That was his first big league hit since August 3rd when he got that hit on September 28th against Boston. Kind of a surreal stat right there since August 3rd. I mean, he just didn't play down the stretch. Even when he did play, he was on a you know nice little Ofer streak throughout August before he got sent down. He just, it just wasn't there. Now, one good thing for Nevin is he did have a great year in AAA when he was down there. It, it was a tough year because... You know, he only got 184 big league plate appearances, but he only got 191 AAA plate appearances because he spent a lot of time on the big league bench. But in his 44 games, 191 plate appearances in AAA Norfolk, he did hit 291, had a 382 on base, a 479 slugging. It was a 130 WRC plus. He had seven homers. He had a great AAA year in those 44 games, but it just did not translate to the big leagues this year. And so it kind of raises the question, you know, is he a 4A guy? He couldn't hit the fastball. He hit just 170 on fastballs. He did hit 296 against changeups, but he was under 200 against breaking balls and fastballs this year in the big leagues. Is he a 4A guy, you know, at age 25 with the Orioles getting better and better and Nevin showing that he just was not ready for the big leagues this year, but his time is kind of running out. You know, he does play first, third, right and left field, but the Orioles pretty locked down in the outfield. Third base is looking pretty locked down with Gunnar Henderson at this point. And at first base, they've got Ryan Nowcastle, and you're certainly not going to have him be a DH. So what do you do with him? And there were even times this year where the Orioles kind of felt like Nevin was at least a plus defender, whether it be third base or first base, they could at least count on him there. But by the end of the season, he had a negative four defensive run saved and a negative five outs above average at third base this year. So 
he was even well below average defensively at that position as well, which is at least something they thought they could count on. You know, he got a few chances as a defensive replacement at third late in games this year, but he couldn't even get that chance, you know, late in the year before he got option to triple A. So it was just a really tough season for Nevin. And yeah, you can say, well, he got less than 200 plate appearances. You know, how can you know what he's going to be at the big league level? I mean, overall, he's got 202 big league plate appearances. How can you really know? You, you really can't. It's too, way too small of a sample size, not even close to a full season in the big leagues. But when he's already 25 and you at least got somewhat of a look at him this year and he did that with all the prospects coming and hopefully the Orioles adding players, I don't know if he has a shot. I mean, the only time we saw him hit any little bit at all was when he was, you know, he was eight, he went eight for 25 in the month of July. Seven of them were singles. That that was about it. So is he a 4A guy? You know, one of these guys that's just too good for AAA. That's what he showed this year, but just can't stick in the big leagues consistently. I think that's where Nevin's going to fall in. And with the defense not being where they want it to be, I don't think he can be a 4A guy who at least holds down a bench spot in the big leagues. I just don't think it's going to happen. And so, you know, we're trying to answer the question, has Tyler Nevin played his final game in an Orioles uniform? I'm not sure if I want to say that yet, just because if there is injuries or whatever, and he does stick around in AAA Norfolk, I could see him coming up to the big leagues, at least for a little bit in a pinch to be on the bench. But barring an injury, he could be done in an O's uniform. And the other question is for Tyler Nevin, I mean, does he even survive the off season on the Orioles 40 man roster? Because he still has some prospect pedigree and he still has that batter's eye and a team could still like his swing. He's down in the Dominican winter league right now, trying to show off that swing, maybe for other teams, but you know, the Orioles 40 man roster sits at 39 players right now. They're going to have to DFA some guys off at this off season. Could Tyler Nevin be one of those guys? I would lean towards no, because he has some options. You can still keep him in AAA as depth, but I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility that if the Orioles made some key moves this offseason and really upped the talent level on their team, that they would consider DFAing Tyler Nevin. And I think someone would certainly claim him, especially, you know, a rebuilding team, give him a chance to play every day and see what they've got. There's no way I think he would get through waivers and the O's would, you know, be able to keep him in AAA if they did that. But it's a decision they might have to make if they really are going to add to this team. And it's unfortunate for Nevin because I liked him. I, I really like him. He seems like a great guy to have in the clubhouse. And I really liked his game in the minors. I was really excited for him to, to come to Baltimore when he came over in the Michael Givens trade, but it just hasn't worked out to this point. And he's gotten passed by a lot of guys. And so I don't know if the O's would DFA him this off season, but it's a possibility. And I don't see, unless there's multiple injuries, him really being a factor for the Orioles moving forward. I think he's just triple a depth at this point. And maybe at some point the O's just do let him go to give him another shot in another organization. But the other guy we're going to talk about today is in a little bit of a different spot. Rugman Odor, more of a veteran player, came in on a one-year deal as a free agent and had maybe the biggest roller coaster of a season for any player in baseball. So coming up next, we will try to break down what was a wild 2022 for Rugnet Odor. But first, got to tell you about betonline.net, which is your number one source for betting football, betting basketball, betting hockey, and betting baseball this November. Now listen, We've got a lot of World Series to be played in the month of November. You can get all the lines and odds on every World Series game. Plus, every NFL Sunday, every college football Saturday, you've got all the lines, all the odds on every single game. They've even got live betting, up-to-the-minute scores for every game out there at Bet Online. And then with the NBA and NHL season starting, and college basketball just a couple weeks away, you can get all the latest player developments, team matchups, news, podcasts, in-depth analysis on every game out there. And there's MMA, boxing, and golf on the site as well. They've got everything. So head to the website today. Use your mobile device to learn more. That's Bet Online, where the game starts. So we're continuing our 2022 Orioles player review series. Just talked about Tyler Nevin and the chances that he is, even with the Orioles next year, might not be as high as you think. But our next guy I wanted to talk about is just, I mean, he had a hilarious season this year. And that was Rugnet Odor. I, I really don't think, I mean, roller coaster and hilarious. Kind of the best two ways to describe what Rugnet Odor did with the Orioles this year. 
And you can love him. You can hate him. I think I did a lot of both throughout the season. I mean, full disclosure, I wanted to sign Rugnet Odor to a lifetime contract at times, and I wanted to straight up release him at some times. It never felt like it was really in between. It was almost one or the other. But I mean, what just a wild year. I mean, he becomes one of the three veterans, along with Chirinos and Lyles, that the Orioles bring in this offseason. And, you know, they only ended up paying, I think, $800,000, $850,000 for him to play for this year because the Yankees and the Rangers were paying most of his contract that he was due on the end of his extension he had signed back with the Rangers a couple of years ago. And the other crazy thing about Rugnet Odor, you know, the Orioles signed him. They actually picked him up back before the lockout started in, you know, early December. And when they signed him, you know, you could tell a player like that was probably going to come in. The Orioles had signed a veteran infielder pretty much every year of the rebuild, you know, with Jose Iglesias's and the Freddie Galvis's of the world, Michael Franco's. So Rugnet Odor fit in that sense. He was the first guy who was a second baseman. But you looked at it and you said, Oh, he's a veteran guy. He's in his 30s. He'll help out. Then you checked his, you know, his fan graphs page. Rugnet Odor was 28 all year. He doesn't turn 29 until February. How is this guy only 28? And it made you think, well, maybe he's got some better baseball ahead of him. And, you know, he had had those terrible years with Texas at the end that caused them to release him. Then, I mean, he had a bit of a bounce back with the Yankees last year. I mean, he did enough for a playoff team to sign him and play him as much as they did, but it was still an 83 WRC plus with the Yankees. Now they did give him over 360 plate appearances. He played in over a hundred games for the Yankees last year, which I still can't believe he hit only 202, but the Orioles bring him in and he kind of had a similar season statistically. I mean, he had an 80 WRC plus this year versus 83 last year, but it was wildly different in terms of the roller coaster that he put Orioles fans on again. His season with the Orioles, 135 games in 472 plate appearances. Odor hit 207 with a 275 on base percentage and a 357 slugging. That was good for an 80 WRC plus, making him 20% worse than the league average hitter this year. He did have 13 home runs. He drove in 53 runs, about a 7% walk rate to a 23% strikeout rate for Odor. It was an insane, insane season where he was never really great for any stretch. You know, he had a 105 WRC plus in September and, you know, the first couple of days of October. That was his best month of the season. The only other month where he was average or better was he had an exactly 100 WRC plus in May. That means he was exactly league average in the month of May. That was his second best month. He had a 52 WRC plus in April. He had a 58 in August. He was horrendous for some months, but he was never really great. I mean, really the best stretch that he had was down the stretch with the Orioles. You know, finally, Brandon Hyde in September just kind of talked about how he was making a switch, going to the younger guys who going to play Taron Vavra more. And Odor sat for four straight days, September 12th through the 15th. Then the Orioles had, you know, Ramon Arias hobbled. And so Odor had to rejoin the lineup. And from September 22nd to the 27th, those Houston and Boston series, he went nine for 17 with multiple extra, extra base hits and big RBI after big RBI in that stretch. And he showed he had, you know, one last punch in him for the Orioles in September. But it was just such a crazy season because I don't think anyone would argue he was on this team for being a clubhouse leader, being a veteran who's been around the block. You know, even though he's only 28, he'd been on a lot of playoff teams. He had played in some big moments. He had some good seasons and, and was given good vibes, good leadership to this team. That's why he was there, not for his production, not for his 80 WRC plus. But what he did was just so crazy. And this, it's just my favorite Rugnet Odor stat. It's maybe my favorite Orioles stat in a long time for a certain player. Looking at Rugnet Odor's numbers in different game situations. So Fangraphs has a metric of leverage. They can separate into low leverage, mid leverage, and high leverage situations in a baseball game. Now your high leverage is generally close game in the seventh, eighth, or ninth, or extra innings. Medium leverage is kind of earlier in the game, close game, low leverage, generally very early in the game or a blowout. Here's WRC plus again, 100 is league average 73 WRC plus in low leverage. Not good. 54 WRC plus in medium leverage spots. That's terrible. And then Rugnet Odor 
had a 187 WRC plus in high leverage spots. That means in high leverage spots, so late in the game with the game close, Rubenet Odor was 87% better than the league average hitter in those scenarios in the 2022 season. It is ridiculous the switch that he was able to flip in high leverage this year. Now, he only had 58 plate appearances in high leverage this year where, you know, he had about 200 in each of the other spots. But four of his 13 home runs came in high leverage despite only 58 plate appearances. He had a 340 batting average in the high leverage. And here's the crazy stat. Just under half of his runs batted in. 24 of his 53 RBIs this year came in those just 58 plate appearances he had in high leverage spots. That is ridiculous from Rugnet Odor. He saved all of his hitting powers for those high leverage spots, whether it was the couple of walk-offs against Tampa, the walk-off homer and the walk-off dribbler up the line, whether it was the crazy home run against Toronto after the rain delay in the eighth inning when Mike Elias was sitting right behind home plate, was celebrating with the rest of the fans, whether it was just the craziest game I'd ever seen against the Texas Rangers when you know the Orioles give up the lead in the top of the ninth and with two outs, Odor homers in the bottom of the ninth to tie the game and send it to extras where the Orioles would walk it off, whether it was him trying to will the Orioles to a win in that crazy Sunday game in Baltimore against the Astros when he had two huge hits in the eighth and then 10th innings. I mean, there were so many more spots where he did this and just, he came up big in the clutch, but he was so bad in every other spot. It's hard to grade out his season. Then even defensively, you know, Brandon Hyde continued to say when he was asked, especially when Odor was slumping bad, why is this guy playing when you have, you know, especially when Taron Vavra got added to the roster in August, it was like, why is Odor playing if you have this guy Vavra who's swinging it, you know, pretty well? Well, he said his leadership and his ability to turn the double play at second. And I will say there's not a great metric that specifically shows how well a guy turns a double play, but you watch him. Rudin at door t- turns a quick double play at second. He is a master at getting that ball from the third baseman or the shortstop and whipping it over to first base in no time at all. And he made some very good highlight reel defensive plays this year. He also had a negative nine defensive run saved and a negative five outs above average at second base this year. So he was by far a below average defender over the whole of the season. And that's just another way that his season was a roller coaster. Wasn't just a roller coaster offensively, was a roller coaster defensively as well. And I think the Odor question of will he ever play another game in an Orioles uniform is much easier to answer than the Nevin question. Nevin's still in the organization on the 40 man roster. Rudman Odor is going to be a free agent after the World Series ends. I can't imagine the Orioles are going to bring him back, which I think most O's fans are happy with that being the fact. But listen, He hit 272 against fastballs this year. He was incredible in the clutch. He's still only going to be 29 years old next year, and he is a left-handed hitter with a lot of experience and a lot of success in the past in his career. So I don't think his MLB career is over by any stretch. I think maybe it'll be on a minor league deal, but I think someone could even give him another one-year major league deal to come back next year. I mean, he's hitting fastballs, hitting the clutch now. Despite hitting 272 against fastballs, he hit 141 against all other pitches this year. That's why he was terrible. Don't know why anybody was ever throwing him a fastball this season. But he's still got something left in the tank. Do I think it's with the Orioles? No, I do not. I do not expect at all any chance of the Orioles bringing him back for 2023, especially because they're going to add at that position. But you got to admit it was kind of fun, even when it was frustrating. And even when it was a roller coaster, and even when he was making egregious errors and striking out seemingly every time at the plate and making weird decisions to bunt in odd times and not getting it down, it was kind of fun. And when you look back on the 2022 season, Rugnet Odor, in a magical Orioles season that I think we'll always remember that kind of kick-started this team back to being good, he had some of the biggest moments of this year. You'll never be able to forget Rugnet Odor as an Oriole because of those big moments. And it was a roller coaster, and it was really, really bad at times. But I will say this. He won't be back. He was not nearly good enough to be back. 
But the magical run that the 2022 Baltimore Orioles went on does not happen without Rugnet Odor. And you can push back on that statement all you want, and you can hate that statement, but you kind of hate it because it's true. This Orioles season doesn't have this much magic if they don't have Rugnet Odor in that lineup. And it hurt to watch him play sometimes, but sometimes it was incredible. I think that's how I'll remember Rugnet Odor's one year as an Oriole. We thank him, we send him off, and we'll always remember some of those incredible moments, whether they were good or sometimes bad. So we're back here talking about Tyler Nevin and Rugnet Odor and their seasons. And I think there's a good chance that neither of those guys ever play a game in an Orioles uniform again. Nevin obviously has a better chance with him still being in the organization and Odor becoming a free agent, but we could potentially see neither of those guys moving forward for the Orioles. I think they'll upgrade at those positions either from in-house or hopefully via free agency as well. But that'll do it for today's episode. Again, rest of the week, we've got three more episodes. We will continue rolling through these player review series throughout the week and then when we come back to you next week on the podcast, it's going to be the off season. And sometime next week, it's going to be five days after the World Series, which means free agency is going to open and it's going to be liftoff. As Mike Elias said, we're going to have you covered from all angles here on this podcast for the Orioles off season, from the moves they could make to the moves they will make. We'll have it all right here on Locked on Orioles. So make sure to like, comment, and subscribe right here on the Locked on Orioles YouTube page. We thank you so much for tuning in. Of course, we thank you for making Locked on Orioles your first listen of the day. Now, if you're looking for your second listen of the day, maybe check out Locked on Sports today. They've got the games that matter. They've got the biggest stories in sports. They go beyond the scoreboard and behind the scenes with local experts and insights only Locked on can provide. Locked on Sports today is available on this app, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcasts. So again, we'll be back here on Locked on Orioles tomorrow, continuing our player review series for the Orioles magical 2022 season. But until then, I'm Connor Newcomb, and this has been the Locked on Orioles podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day.